and as people who are my pals know, well, I will first read the description so we know what we're supposed to be talking about, and then I will ask all the panelists to um, introduce themselves and if they want to also state why they are here. Um, and Okay, as writers, we learn very early on to handle rejection. But how do you handle it when a story you're sure is good is rejected by 20 different publications? I can't believe I only put 20 here. I, I <laughs> um, or when your carefully crafted novel is shrugged off by five different agents. Or your self-published novella is bought by only 25 people, all of them friends and relatives. Or your fantasy novel disappears from public view after a couple of weeks. We'll explore personal strategies to deal with disappointments, rejection, and other setbacks. Um, I came up with this idea last year, and as you can imagine, I was not in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, why don't we start from that end, and you can and introduce yourself and say why you're here. Sure. My name is Susan Bigelow. Uh, I'm a writer of uh, science fiction, mostly. Um, I've got about five books out from small presses. Uh, mostly, I, if you know about me at all, you may know me from short stories. I've got short story publishing a couple of uh, a couple of the bigger publications like Apex and Stranger Eyes and Lightspeed and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm here. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. I certainly have had a lot of lot of setbacks in my career. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think about that as a, as a career. It's like, wow, really, in the last five years or so. Um, I have had that experience of trying to send out a book that I believed in so much. I was certain it was awesome. Great book. That's I'm trying to send it out, to, you know, because I don't have an agent, so I'm querying it to agents over and over and over again. I must have gotten 40 rejections uh, from different agents for that book. Um, I think I may have a lead on it now. So everybody, cross your fingers <laughs> for me. Um, but no, but because, again, um, my, my books come from small presses, it's very hard to get noticed. It's very hard to build up a fan base. It's very hard to get a lot of traction. And so I feel like, you know, I feel like there's just been a ton of discouragement coming my way, and so I've had to deal with that in all kinds of ways. And hopefully I'll be able to share some strategies. Okay. <laughs> um, Michael J. Daly, I'm a sci-fi writer for children primarily, but I write science, non-fiction science as well sometimes, and uh, um, been trying to make a living as, as a writer since graduating college, many, many years ago now. Um, and um, my record's quite similar. My, my favorite book, Shanghai to the Moon, in, um, took 10 years and 40 rejections at least before it was published. Career has been in trouble since the economic downturn as well. I had sort of just made it as a mid, mid list author when the crash happened, and it's, it's had a lot of damage. So there's some. And uh, if you want to help me with deal with this card, one thing you can do is uh, buy a subscription to my latest uh, serial novel because nobody has yet, and it's very discouraging. <laughs> Whatever his house was, and they had all his old rejection slips there. 
uh, which sound just like the rejection slips you get. We were read to inform you, blah, blah, blah. And there was a stack of them, not as tall as me, but sort of as tall as Gene behind glass. And we looked at them, and some people would look at that and say, man, I'm screwed. You know? And he and I looked at them and said, that's a dare. Yeah. You know, that's a dare. <laughs> so then what I want to hope to talk about is how to get people to infuse that attitude within themselves as opposed to the uh, throw in the door and just do hard time thing. But to show that there are enough rewards to doing it that it's worth continuing. So a turnaround that's fair. Um, and again, my name is Barbara Krasnoff. I'm a short story writer. I published, I think, 30 to 40, I, but I've never published anything longer. Um, I finally collected a bunch of them and tweaked them and hoped to sell them as sort of a mosaic novel, but I could get up enough courage to actually market the damn thing, because while I spent my life trying to sell the short stories and I've gotten huge amounts of rejections, um, I can deal with those, dealing with rejection of the entire thing I'm not sure I can handle. So I'm, I'm hoping to get some um, advice from this panel. My name is Sharon Lewitt. I am a science fiction writer, uh, 10 hard science fiction novels, seven fantasy of adult novels, about 40 or 50 short stories. Um, and I never went on the slash your rest up and down um, end of things because I'm always feeling completely suicidal. I get so many rejections that it's not even worth talking about. When we moved house to up to the Boston area, I finally threw out all of the ones I collected, which was a good thing. Wait a minute, we had to get down to the weight for the uh, <laughs> Children's book world, which is a little different than adult publishing, 
because we mostly still don't have to go entirely through agents, so we're usually communicating with editors directly. And um, so when we're getting something, you're actually getting a response from an editor. Unfortunately, the world has changed. From early in my career, which was 25 years ago, they would actually take the time to write you a note. Um, even if they were rejecting it, they would write something. And you'd suddenly feel like you were in a communication. And it still hurts. It hurts a lot. But as you get a little bit of malice on you, you realize, wait a minute, they, it was worth them noticing that story. It was worth so you have to sort of turn it around in your head into what it actually means, not what it feels like. It, it always hurts. It doesn't matter. But you know you love it. You know it's worth it. They should have grabbed it. But wait a minute, it was good enough that this editor took the time to respond. And that is like a gem. You grab it and hang onto it. Um, and unfortunately, the world has changed so bad that not only do they take a year normally to respond, they have started to not even respond. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for fellow writers in my writing groups and stuff to deal with this. It's like there's no deal, you know, no feedback is worse even bad feedback because then it really feels like you're pitching in the black hole. But we will touch. Yeah, this is the new normal in children's literature in children's if you write on the publisher's website. If you do not hear from us in three months, you may consider it rejected. That is the way they are doing it in the children's world. So they just um, do that too. It's yeah, you just in other words it's, it's just but Yet, they're still arrogant enough to say, but single submissions only. Yeah. And it's like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, attitude is one way to uh, Well, for me, I think things are getting, you're making me feel less discouraged Good. by the fact that you're writing a book. Because I was just looking at some stories of mine, uh, because I have all the rejection slips, and I actually have a list of when they got sent out and so forth. Uh, so I was looking at a story of mine that I wrote, I think, March, last March. Okay, so it's 4, 13, so 17 months now. It's been rejected 22 times, right? I look back at something going on in the mid-80s with the same number of rejections, and it took six years for that story to get rejected. Now, so things are better from that standpoint that you're going to find out immediately. <laughs> uh, so I, I agree with Susan very much. I do try to break the land speed record for getting the story back out again. If I can keep it under an hour, I try to keep it under an hour. I got 48 minutes once from the date of the email to the person rejecting it to be getting out again. Uh, one of the benefits I have from so many rejections over the years is I can be heartened by the fact that having sold a story to a door anthology after having it rejected 29 times by other markets, I can then look at other stories and say, well, it'll happen when it happens. Uh, the it's not personal is very important, which I learned from some masters. Uh, I went to Clarion in 1979, and Kate Wilhelm, one of the things she would do at the beginning is she would say, this is your manuscript. This is you. This is your manuscript. You know, say, this is not you. This, this is a piece of paper with words on it. Uh, so keeping it non-personal is very important, and coming to the understanding that it really is about the story, that once you achieve a certain level of confidence of not even saying it's a bad story, it could be a good story, but they have to fall in love with that the same way you would fall in love with another person. When I was doing science fiction age, you got 10,000 stories a year or public 60. Could there be anything personal about the 9,900? You know, it was not. Um, you have to sort of feel the idea that eventually there is a person who will know the story as much as you. And one more thing, the story, the story, the piece of paper is not you, the story is not your career. You should think, I'm not in it for this story. My life's goal is to not publish this one story. My life's goal is to get better, and this is just one step, and if it's not this story, when the right, when the editor gets my next story, that editor, she'll think, Oh, you know, this person sent that other story that wasn't half bad. Let's see how this one is. And, and you, that, the purpose of that story might have been to increase you this much in the estimation of the editor. So when I can't say open the middle envelope anymore because it's been several years since I've sent anyone a middle envelope in the story. But so when that email comes, oh, that's from that person. I wonder if, you know, this, this time they may be on a theme or a topic where they may pull it off. So 
think of that as a career, not as a story. And maybe the story that's meant to be the one that everyone remembers, you'll write 10 years and 50 stories from now. Yeah, I've actually begun doing something which, which sounds sort of uh, pessimistic, but it isn't. Like when I send out a story, and I'll be looking at the other markets and say, OK, this anthology is opening in, in two months. I should get this rejection back <laughs> in time to, to send it to this anthology. And I will actually balance it, because if it's a really good anthology, I'll say, well, I know this guy will reject it in a week, but these people won't get back to me in three months. And in that case, I won't get it back in time to send it there. <laughs> so it's become almost a mathematical balancing act. And, and if one of them ha happens to actually accept it, well, you know, it's all for the good. I use Duotrip. If anyone doesn't know that website, you get a month free trial and it costs $50 a year to keep track of D-U-O-T-R-O-P-E. Uh, like the Ryan, you're just the same thing. It's free. Yeah. yeah. Duotrip charges now, so yeah. go for it. I mean, I'm sorry. I thought Ryan or something else. I did <laughs> Handling the emotional end of it. 
Because much as we say, yeah, you're professional, you're hardened to it, you, when you've gotten over a thousand of them, it's kind of old hat, but it never stops hurting. It never entirely goes away. And I think it's fair to say, I'm putting myself on the line here. And yeah, the story might not be me, but it's something that I cared a lot about. And I worked my butt off. Mm -hmm. And somebody didn't like it. And I don't want to know that. <laughs> so I deserve to, to go out and buy a new pair of shoes or drink my bow more under the covers and watch The Lion King and eat Chinese food. All at the same time. <laughs> the Chinese food comes from because I grew up in Manhattan. So. Um, Good Chinese food. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed that I, I don't understand, but there it is. I mean, like on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, some people, they not only tweet or, or, or Facebook or whatever, they not only announce, ah, I sold the story to X, which is discouraging enough to me, but um, <laughs> especially when, when it's the same market I was trying to get into. But also they will say, oh, I just got a, my 30 term rejection and I, you know, I'm really upset about it. I'm like, why are you telling me this? I do that all the time. <laughs>
And I, I think it's, it's we can kind of get into this this idea that we're all uh, that you know we're so isolated, and we all feel like oh I must be the worst writer ever. You can imposter syndrome. Uh, it's actually good to know that there's other people in, in the boat with you, and that you're all the same. Uh, so you can. You know, in, in the, the depths of my misery, I will make a tweet. Uh, you can follow me whatever season, and that's my handle. And I, you will see my woe. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you how bad. Because it's it's a little cathartic, uh, and, and other writers will say, oh, you're good, that's fine. But it's also nice to be able to celebrate with, with the friends and the people that you know when they do sell something, because then it also gives you hope for yourself. I pick up from that. About the group, I, I'm not. I don't do anything online because I've been in a steady writing group for 30 years with other uh, children's, both professional and aspiring writers. Um, and uh, chocolate's important. Projection time. Um, <laughs> and sharing that way we share. But I wanted to something sort of come up in the fabric um, that there's sort of two prerequisites to that kind of perseverance, which is obvious to me, perseverance, and, 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 and those strategies not to wallow, because I, I've known writers who do wallow, and it, it's, it's terrible, terrible for them, terrible for their friends. Um, and even the one, and I've even known writers who, you know, they've worked for years on a novel, and they get one rejection, and in it goes, and you never hear another word, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I don't think there's something not so good about that. But, one of the protections is a certain amount of self-confidence, which has not come easy to writers, I don't think. Uh, certainly hasn't to me, but craft, a kind of real sense that you put your nose to the grindstone and have learned to write with some real confidence. Um, and once you, once for me, once I work on a piece until I feel you know, it's a nebulous thing, but to the, to the best of my skills at the time that I've written the story, I feel it is complete as I envisioned it. And once I've achieved that, that's what I, that's what the whole story has been for me, is I want to take that vision and put it into words so that what I see on the page is what I had in my head. Once you get to that stage, it's, you got to have a sense that it's done. And then, now you're testing it, you're throwing it out in the market. But, Part of it is not to let too much of the feedback shape that that belief in the story. It's to, because for one thing, if you don't do that, and I've seen writers do this too, every little comment, and it's like, oh, what did I do wrong? I'm rewriting it, and there goes another three months. <laughs> and it's like, oh, wait a minute, that story was fun. It was close enough. And besides, any single person's response is irrelevant because it's that person's response and now they're not buying it. So it doesn't matter what they, what, what they thought was wrong with your story because this editor is going to think something else is wrong. And it, it's not, that's not what they're looking for. What's wrong, they're looking for that love that, that, that Scott is talking about. They want to fall in love. And they've got 10,000 opportunities a week. <laughs> and so they're going to be picking them. I'd actually like to speak to this from kind of the other end. I don't post my rejections. Um, and I lost a friend over this once, too. She was a, an aspiring artist, and she thought she was very talented. She has finally actually moved into doing um, graphic art for a living. But for a long time, she wanted to be a cover artist, and she thought she could just put some drawings up in, in, in con art shows and be discovered it was great. And I told her what she had to do, because um, I had friends who were artists, and I introduced her to artists. And I told her about my rejections, which I didn't talk about very much, except in my writer's group. Um, and the reason why I don't, even though she, and she was furious, and she said, you never told me those things. You're a liar. And it's like, <laughs> but the reason I don't is I don't want to dwell on it. I get my 24 hours and it's gone, over, past, and those doors are shut. I don't want to count how many times has this been rejected, how, um, because that puts me back into that space of feeling frightened again. And we lose more people, more talented people stop writing and stop publishing because of fear and because of that 
that pain that happens every time something's rejected. There is no such thing as a writer or artist who hasn't been rejected many, many, many times. <laughs> Just, and if someone says that, they're lying. But I have the right to put it behind me. I don't want to think about it. I'm not going to put it on Facebook or Twitter. I'm not going to talk about it because it's over. You know, it's interesting uh, because it's how, it shows how individuals treat it so differently. For example, I had a story that was extremely close to me. Uh, I loved the story. It was a comic story, but it was based, it was what came out of my father's death, I mean, who I was very close to. And I kept sending that sucker out and out. And I was counting, and I was saying, okay, this one, this is getting close to my, you know, uh, it's going to be out more than any other story, but the more it went out, the more I was damned I was going to sell that sucker. Uh, because was, Jim knows, he knows which story I'm talking about. And I did, finally, and I sold it to a very good market. Um, but, you know, so for some odd reason, and usually I feel the same way you do, but in that case I felt the more it got rejected, I, and I wanted to see each rejection, and I wanted to look at it because I was like, those, those son of a bitches, I am going to show them. <laughs> I very much agree with Sherry Ann's uh, despair over how many writers the rejection have crushed. As I said, there are writers who have given up who are more talented uh, than I was at the time. Not because the talent was not enough, they had to have the ability uh, to move forward. And there's that line that I'm going to misquote now, because it's not, I'm thinking Carson McCullough, but I know it's not Carson McCullough, it's someone else, who had asked if she, if she afraid that writing workshops may stifle too many writers. And she said, well, not enough of them. The first time you hear that, you know, it's sort of funny and we all laugh at it, but when you really think about it, it's really sad. Because there are stories of people who had wonderful stories to tell, who are too fragile to accept the fact that it might be the 20th or 30th or 50th down the road. I know many people who wanted two rejections and it goes in the drawer and they don't try to sell it anymore. I know people who stop writing for years. Uh, and and uh, I will just give one further example. There were a couple when I edited Science Fiction Age, which I did for eight years. There were people I was in writing workshops with, or I had been, I stopped workshopping at the time, who I told them, I said, remember that story that you did in the workshop a couple of years before I left? Why don't you, you know, I think there's something in there. Why don't you just send it to me again so I can give it another read and see if I can figure out now that I, you know, and I had two people who never sent me the story. Oh. And actually, my wife, who goes to romance conventions, tells me that she hears from agents that many people who do those pitch sessions with agents at romance conventions, yeah. and an agent will say, OK, send me that. And the number of people who do not send it okay. is staggering. Oh, yeah. You know, that they were given. It's just, so, and it's just so sad that there are people who got to the point that say, I'm too downhearted, and it's not worth the despair. Like, I don't know if it was. I couldn't bear sending it to Scott, and then he wouldn't find a solution if we not want or what. But it's just very sad, and, and we're giving too much depressing stuff instead of the, the methods. So everyone, <laughs> shout out the methods to deal with this and set it aside so we don't send them on. Okay. Yes. Okay. I have two stories to tell about this. Um, and I always tell students in creative writing classes that talent is just a small piece of the mix. Personality, especially being Reference is probably more important than basic talent. Because you can learn a lot of craft, you can learn to tell stories better, but you can't learn to be tough enough to deal with the business. So, two stories. First of all, when I was an undergrad, I only took two English classes, but one of them was a playwriting class, and there was another woman in the class with me who was brilliant. She was so much better than me, I was constantly feeling like, you know, that low. Um, and kept thinking, well, it's OK. I'm applying for grad school in computational biology and, and pure math anyway, so it's not going to be that bad um, if I don't make it as a writer. And I met her years later. I moved to DC for my very first job out of grad school. and. We ran into each other. She had gone to law school. She said she was going to do as her family expected. She had never said, my first novel was just coming out. Um, and I had it. I mean, this is within a month of it being published. And I met with her for lunch. And she said she would show me some of her 
stories. She forgot to bring them for a lunch. I gave her a copy of my novel. She had never sent anything out because she was too frightened. Nothing was perfect enough and somebody might send her a rejection and it would be the end of the world. And it's like, you know, you have all the talent in the world, but you don't have what it takes to really be a writer. The other story I want to tell is I was in one of those incredibly savage workshops and I was absolutely torn up, down, and sideways with three different forms of razors by a very prominent member of the profession. Um, and he basically, he not only criticized the words on the paper, he criticized me personally and said that I didn't have what it took to be able to finish this book, blah, 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 blah. Um, I went home and I hid it under the cover and drank for a month. I was completely devastated, and I really thought that I couldn't write. But there was a problem with this, though. The book was under contract. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, you, know, you might not think that I could write. You might think that um, trees should not die for my sins, but the book is under contract. So I finished it, and it's what took me out of the mid-list to the top of the list. There you go. Um,
I would say, yeah, you hear different things from different editors, but I would have no problem because it's sort of like saying if you would date, uh, uh, you know, Gordon Van Gelder, would you date Charles Coleman Finley or something like that? <laughs> writing 
you respect and whose judgments you respect, that's a protection against that. We always share rejections and analyze the lines and and to know, I mean, sometimes you can have enough self-confidence yourself, but often a little reinforcement doesn't hurt. And you know, you have to be several of us have also mentioned, oh, I know this writer who's this far above me. You know, and I know that all the time to I other writers in my writers group, I feel like I'll never write as good as that. God damn it. And that's good because that means if they like my story, I got something going for me. I mean, that you know, people you respect like it. And an editor is just an anonymous somebody. And if, if your other writers are honest and it's a good critique group, they will be able to say, no, they don't know what they're talking about, or uh oh, we all miss something, or maybe that does need a look at. But don't. Try not to leave yourself all alone with those kind of <laughs> statements. I would say have faith in your work. Um, when an editor sends you that kind of rejection, what they're saying really, and this is my experience with most things, is they're saying, I'm not the right person for this. They're not saying this is crap. They're saying, I'm not the right person for it. Uh, so send it back out. Send it back out. If you get two editors saying the same thing, that's OK, that's something else. Three, yeah. But if just one says it, send it back out and see what happens. Yeah, thank you. Um, now that rejection letters are coming through email, and there's no handwritten notes, no opportunity for them, how do you know, is there, any, is there any way to know whether it's a standard rejection or? Oh, yeah, you can tell. Usually there'll be some sort of language. Um, uh, you, you, usually the, the form rejection looks like a form rejection. It'll say something like, thank you for your submission. Uh, yes, this is not right for us and probably for us at this time period. Usually if you get something a little more than that, you get you know, something from the actual editor saying, oh, I like this story, but this. Or, you know, this is nice, but this, this didn't work for us. Please send us more of your work. That's, that's good. I mean, I, and sometimes you have to read the whole thing because it, they'll start, you know, they'll take a, a, a uh, preview, yeah, thank you for sending this, or this was the right person this time. Yeah. And then at the bottom I'll say something like, Barbara, we spent, you know, two hours trying to figure out whether we could fit this in and we couldn't, I'm really sorry. Right. Which, but, which is something I got recently. <coughs> and you know that, you know. That's pretty good. Oh, sure. <laughs> Understand, I mean, many of them, some, yeah. some I wonder about, but many understand <laughs> that writers are sensitive people and, and that they are rejecting something that you love. I mean, they know you put your heart into it. And so the form rejection is actually a courtesy, it's a politeness. Yes. It's vacuous, it doesn't say yay, it doesn't say nay. It's, it's neutral so that, it, they, so that they don't hurt you. I mean, because you, in fact, can devastate writers. And it's rare. I've, I don't think I've heard more than two examples in my whole life of, of hearing other people's rejections where an editor will actually write something negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, got, I got two. Okay. I've, got to, I've got to tell this one though, really. I once got a rejection signed on peach colored paper, signed in three colors of crayon from an anthology saying the story wasn't as bad as Space Babies from Mars, but it was close. Oh, <laughs>
becomes story number two, becomes the story. The only time I've done what you've done is I have one story where I have it. One is a, under a thousand words, <laughs> and one is about 2,200 words. Whichever one I sell first, the <laughs> 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 the story, the other one gets, you know, the other one was not really the story. Well, <laughs> I was strengthened against doing that because I once had a letter from Horace Gold, the great Horace, the, the oh, yeah. greatest not the world. It's a strange word to use. But the, the, the letter began, I will buy this if you. And he listed five things, including change the title to X, whatever X was. I looked at it and I said, ah, they, they pay very well, it's a nice market, and I can sort of agree with some of this. I went ahead and did it. I sent it to him. I got back a letter saying, you obviously didn't understand a word that I said in the title letter, and where did you get that stupid title? <laughs>